Hi, everybody, and good evening. Uh, my name is Jesse Scharf, uh, and, uh, or Stacy Scharf's husband, as I'm known in this room. Um, on behalf of the Smiths, Diane, Mark, Micah, and their extended family, I just wanted to extend uh, their thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, I suspect most or all of us uh, thought we would be doing, oh, there you go, the mayor of Beverly Hills walking in on cue right now. Lily Bossy, um, had, had something else to do, and the fact that there are so many of us literally standing room only uh, is a testament to Mallory and the Smith family. Um, special thanks to three groups of people, actually four groups of people. Uh, first, we have a number of local dignitaries, uh, the perpetual city council person, former mayor, and frequent Facebook poster, Lily Bossy. Uh, just friend Lily Bossy, and you'll see what I mean. Uh, and the Beverly Vista principal, Christian Fuhrer. Is Christian here? He's somewhere. Okay. Uh, whoever, wherever he is, Christian, thank you very much for lending us this facility. Uh, as you might imagine, it's not very easy to find a facility on a Saturday night that will hold 500 to 1,000 or more people. Uh, and he did it. And thanks to, to Christian and others at Beverly Vista for allowing this to happen on short notice. Beverly Vista is, believe it or not, where Diane went to grammar school, um, and uh, Mallory and Micah uh, also went to the Beverly Hills school systems. So it's great to be celebrating Mallory's life in this environment. Uh, special thanks also to um, Lily, Eileen, Ronit, and Stacy, uh, and all the other friends, uh, especially Mallory's, who practically moved cross country to um, help the Smiths and help Mallory um, uh, and help pull this event together. Uh, I'm sure I left folks out. Sorry about that, but thanks to all of you. Little round of applause. There are four seats up here. Uh, can four of you guys please walk down quietly down the hall? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I also want to thank um, I want to thank three very very special people. Uh, make sure I make remember their names: uh, Diane, Mark, and Micah, for um, bringing Mallory into the world. Um, and nurturing her um, and allowing all of us to, um, to share um, in, in Mallory. So thank you guys. Why are we here? Uh, hopefully that's obvious. We're here to celebrate Mallory um, um, and show our support to the Smiths, but mostly we're here to celebrate Mallory's life. That's, that's why everybody is here standing behind me. Uh, it's an incredible life, um, and I think we're here to hopefully smile, uh, have a good time, and share stories, um, not to grieve or cry, although I can't stop anybody from doing that uh, if they want to. Um, a few notes um, in terms of seating. Um, is there anybody standing up right now who needs a seat, who absolutely needs a seat? Right. If you see an older person standing in the aisle and you're not an older person, please get up and make room for them. Um, after the ceremony, uh, the Stone family is hosting folks uh, for Delhi and more opportunity to, to talk. Uh, I'll provide the address uh, towards, towards the end. Um, in terms of speaking, uh, is there anybody in the audience who believes they were asked to prepare remarks who's not standing behind me right now? Okay, other than immediate family members and doctors. Uh, fantastic, and Susan Gottlieb, okay, perfect. Um, so um, everyone up here is going to speak after the family speaks. Uh, we do have a fairly hard and fast rule of one minute. Uh, I should be addressing this to the people behind me, but I already have. Um, I have a stopwatch. I have a cane. Um, if you're not done in a minute, you're done. Uh, if anybody can't finish their speech and wants some help reading it, just let me know and happy, happy to help out. Um, people have asked what they can do. Um, and the answer is uh, they should smile. Um, they should celebrate Mallory's life. Um, they should uh, stop by afterwards and, and talk about Mallory and eat pastrami or turkey or roast beef um, or whatever they have for vegetarians. Um, and, and if anybody wants to, um, if anybody feels compelled to do so, um, they should make a contribution either to Mallory's Garden, Care of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, or to Lunge for Lungs, uh, or to both. Uh, the address is on this paper. There is a Mishaberach on one side, and there is uh, donation information on the back. Um, 
And, and finally, if anybody else wants to speak uh, and they can't make it to the Stones House tonight, uh, I believe that there will be another occasion to do so on Monday evening. Is that correct, Diane? Uh, at Judy Carlin's house, um, more deli food as well? Deli food as well and an opportunity to speak. Um, we are going to start off with the uh, immediate family members um, speaking, and then we are going to switch to um, primarily the kids, plus Bruce Resnikoff um, standing behind me. Uh, and um, Mark, you're number one. Thank you, Jesse, for herding the cats. And thank you to all of us for joining today to celebrate the brief, wondrous life of Mallory Beatrice Smith. Now you're making me cry. Um, Mallory always lived happy and taught Diane and Mark to do likewise. And she did this with full awareness of her own mortality. Let me know if you want to continue. Yeah. One afternoon, when she was nine years old, Mallory refused to do her airway clearance treatment. Diane, uh -oh. Diane, usually so persuasive, couldn't make any headway with her. She called me at work and asked me to come home to see what I could do. I sat down with Mallory at the kitchen table. Knowing it was not time for sugar coating, I said, Sweetheart, we don't insist that you do your treatments just so you'll feel better. If you don't do them, you will get sick and die. Mallory burst into tears, leaped up, ran into her room, and slammed the door twice. I asked myself, have I been cruel, forcing upon a nine-year-old the certain knowledge of her own death? Mallory didn't speak to me for three days after that, but she never missed another treatment. And she wrote her high school health class term paper on improvements in the mean survival age of cystic fibrosis patients. Faced to grow up early, she was always an old soul. Unlike many teenagers and 20-somethings, she never acted like she was in a dress rehearsal. Life was opening night for Mallory. She connected with me differently than with her mother. Diane was her wing mom, and I was more the academic consultant. Our connection was intellectual, humorous, literary, and, sadly, medical. Before she could read, I read aloud to her. On car trips, we listened to audiobooks, and when she started to read on her own, I tried to keep up with her voracious, eclectic reading appetite until I couldn't anymore. We formed an informal two-person book club. We but you guys actually read the books. Yes. And and we did not have wine. We learned from our reading and from each other. When we read Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut, Jr., we learned the lesson that Billy Pilgrim learned from the Tralfamadorians. When a person dies, he only appears to die. He is still very much alive in the past, so it is silly for people to cry at his funeral. All moments, past, present, and future, always have existed and always will exist. Tralfamadorians see the moments together in one glance, the way we see a mountain range. Seeing a dead person, a Tralfamadorian notes that the person is in bad condition in that particular moment, but that the same person is just fine in plenty of other moments. He shrugs what he has instead of shoulders and says, so it goes. Mallory had a highly developed sense of humor and was unflaggingly kind. She always laughed at my jokes, no matter how many times she had heard them before. And one night at the dinner table, Diane scolded me for forgetting to do something I had promised to do, saying, 
you're really in the doghouse. Looking up guiltily, I said, Woof! Mallory laughed so hard that milk sprayed out of her nostrils. Much more than my feeble attempt at humor, her spontaneous response had diffused the tension. I loved every minute I got to spend with Mallory. My grief today is dwarfed by the joy she gave me. I will be forever thankful for the 25 years I had with her. Friend, to whom do I offer these thanks? To Diane. Without her clear-sighted sensitivity, her tenacious persistence, and her unerring judgment, Mallory would not have lived into her teens. Diane arranged playdates for Mallory, but only with girls whose mothers would dispense her enzyme pills. When Mallory asked if she could take piano lessons, Diane said, no, we can't have you sitting around inside when it's sunny outside. You should be outside playing soccer. And thus began Mallory's impressive athletic career. Diane never missed a soccer, basketball, or water polo game, a volleyball match, or a swim meet, at home or away. When Mallory's health started to decline, Diane became her fiercest advocate. She did battle with ho stupid hospital policies, lazy nurses, non-compliant doctors, and murderous health insurance companies. When she and Mallory were on the way to the airport to go to Pittsburgh for Mallory's initial transplant evaluation, the hospital called and told them not to come because the insurance coverage hadn't been approved. Diane didn't even think about turning back, working her phones and email from the car, the airport terminal, and the airplane itself. With an assist from Don Fracchia, she persuaded the insurance company to reverse itself, and they confirmed in writing that UPMC was approved for the evaluation and for the transplant itself and would be treated as an in-network provider. So thank you, Diane, for myself and on behalf of everyone who loved Mallory, for your superhuman efforts that gave Mallory the most normal, most wonderful life she could have had in her circumstances. And thank you most of all for the last 10 years we had with her. We will miss you, my darling Mallory. We will strive to live our lives so as to be worthy of your memory. Rest in peace, so it goes. Diane. By the way, nobody should be offended if Diane doesn't hug her. It doesn't hug them. She's not hugging anybody prior to this one. My profound apologies for not greeting anyone or giving hugs. For once, it's not about Mallory and germs. I know that in order to get through this, I needed to stay detached. This is the hardest thing I will ever do, and I'm looking forward to hugging everyone, everyone after. Before I start, we're going to pass around C's candy in honor of Mallory. Her nickname for Micah was Bridge, and then it was Sidge, Pidge, and Midge. That would be me. Pidge got his nickname because Mark cooed like a pigeon to call the dogs. So in honor of Mallory, we're going to pass the chocolates. I don't know where they are, but somebody's going to pa pass the chocolates. Here. Oh, no, I will bug me. Here. OK. I know Jesse's going to introduce everybody, but I just have to say I am so honored that Dr. Shagian and Dr. Mohabir are here, two of the three doctors that made my life bearable, Dr. Mohabir from Stanford, Dr. Shagian from UCLA, and Dr. Paluski, who we grew to love with so much of our hearts for taking Mallory 
and for really taking that journey with us. I got the most heartbreaking email from him. I think he took the death as hard as we did. Okay. Dad, can you wave your hand? My dad is back there. In May, my mom died, but we didn't get to grieve her because we were en route to Pittsburgh. And I just want to say, Dad, I miss Mom every day, and I know you do too. This has been a really difficult year for us, first losing my mom and then losing my daughter. While our hearts are broken, I don't want today to be about grief. Instead, I want to share some memories of Mallory and hear stories from her closest friends and family. Mal called herself a cockroach, saying, CF keeps trying to kill me, but I don't die. She knew dying was a real possibility, and in fact, left written instructions. These are her words taken from her journal. I want my family to lean into each other, not shatter, while dealing with grief. I want my parents to support and embrace Micah and cultivate a rich family life with him. Okay, you're, you're <laughs> gonna break my back. <laughs> Just <laughs> Despite his making choices that we might not agree with. The hair, for one. <laughs> I want to be remembered all the stages of my life, not just me as a sick person at the end. I want my death to bring positive change by spurring people to love more fiercely, to take advantage of opportunities, to enjoy their lives, and to give back and make an impact in healthcare, social justice, and the environment. These are the issues about which I was passionate. This is my favorite. I want my mom to read my journals. I tried to read her journals so many times. <laughs> got my hand slapped. She said, I want my mom to read my journals and edit them to get rid of anything that was mean or hurtful. I want my journals to provide insight and material for people to feel like they have something left of me to hold on to. I wouldn't want it to be something that hurts anyone because of something I wrote when I was emotional or upset years ago. When Mal was getting ready to leave for Stanford, I told Maria that with Mal gone, we didn't need live and help anymore. But she was part of our family, and so I would do whatever I could to find another family for her to work for. Mal interrupted me to say that if Mallory was not, if Maria was not welcome to live with us when it was time to come home for Thanksgiving, she wouldn't be coming home. <laughs> Maria is here with us seven years later and not going anywhere. A few years back, when it was clear to me that our beloved Dewey, our 11-year-old white lab, was struggling to get up because his hips were bad, I told everyone it was time to put him down. Mark and Micah were not happy with this, but they seemed to understand that I didn't want our dog to suffer. Maria called me a murderer. <laughs> Remember that, Maria? Mallory, sim Mallory simply asked, are you going to put Grandpa down too because he has a bad hip? There are so many stories of Mal and her instinct to protect the underdog, or in this case, the dog. As many of you know, okay, as many of you know, I am Mal's wing mom. I got the nickname years ago when we were on vacation in Hawaii, and I would troll the beach looking for kids to play with her. And in later years, when we were out and about with all her friends, I'd call out CBAs, which stood for Cute Boy Alert. As the years passed and her health declined, my job as wing mom was about creating a life for her inside our various homes with dinner parties and movie nights so that she wouldn't be isolated. Through all this, I've come to care about Mallory's friends with the same love I do my own amazing friends, and I often say that I love to channel my inner 25. A few weeks ago, right before Mal went into the hospital for the last time, Mark surprised me with the wing mom license plate. I thought it was super cool, but I wanted it as a piece of art, not on my car. Mallory looked at Mark and quietly pulled me aside to say that Mark had been working on getting this for me for a year, and she was afraid I would hurt him deeply if I didn't use it the way he had hoped. This was vintage Mallory, <laughs> always reading social cues and worrying about people's feelings. On one of my visits to LA, when Mark was in Pittsburgh, I tried repeatedly to reach Mark, but he did not answer the call. Mallory had had a bad bout with hemoptysis, a 911 to the ER, and I was worried sick. After four times, I gave up. 
15 minutes later, Mark called, but I was so upset that he hadn't taken my calls that I decided to punish him and not answer the phone. He was completely on to me. I guess it is hard to get away with anything that transparent after 30 years of marriage. And he said, if I was going to be so childish, we should just get a divorce. Mal was a witness to this exchange and gently told Mark he was overreacting. She explained to him that I was distraught at leaving her and that he should cut me some slack. How Mallory was so wise and so caring is still a mystery to me, but it explains why she was so beloved, as she always put the needs of others before her own. Mal's friends are too numerous to name, but I can tell you she had great taste with regards to whom she chose to hang out with. In all the years she made her own plans, I never ever had to suggest that someone was not a good influence. Same for all the boys she dated. Starting with Julian and ending with Jack, we came to care about each one of them and saw them through her filter as kind, caring, and beautiful people. When friends would complain that their moms didn't approve of their boyfriends, she would always thank me for accepting her choices. I told her it wasn't hard to do as she had impeccable taste, especially with Jack. I had planned to tell you more about this amazing young man and the beautiful relationship he shared with my daughter, but Jack is gonna speak, and since he is the only non-family member Jack who gets a pass on the time limit, I suspect you'll understand why we've grown to love him and consider him family. I just do want to share one moment that happened this past summer when Mal, Jack, and I were hanging out on the couch in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Jack turned to me and asked if I would ever let him live with Mallory. I was incredibly touched by this respectful and mature gesture, but something inside me said I better not answer. I took a pause, and in that moment, Mal jumped in and looked at Jack incredulously and said, why are you asking her? I Remember that? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I can decide with whom I will or won't live. Dis despite her easygoing nature and skills of diplomacy, she did know how and when to assert herself. After transplant, in the brief period between when she finally got past the unbearable surgical pain and before she wound up in the hospital for the final time, we spent many, many hours talking about Jack, their future, and what she wanted for herself. She wanted to live with him at the beach so very badly but she said he might be moving to the East Coast for work or graduate school. I said whatever she wanted to do was fine with me, but the one thing I did not think she should do is have a long distance relationship with someone when she was finally able to, to have some semblance of health and a normal life. Mal said she would never do that. Her words, Mom, Jack has made so many sacrifices to be with me, I would support him in whatever he wants to do. Always unselfish, always putting the needs of others before her own. That was Mallory. Mal was also an overachiever. In addition to being a three-sport athlete in high school and winning Athlete of the Year, she was straight-A student and prom queen. This last accomplishment became a running joke between us, as I would always list it when I was talking about her, and she would say, Mom, no one cares. <laughs> and it was always accompanied by a very dramatic eye roll. But I maintain that it speaks to her popularity, as she was not the prettiest girl in the class, but rather loved by so many. <laughs> Two sports stories about Mal. The first one was on Bruce Reznikoff's basketball team, and apparently he was going to tell the same story, but I beat him to it. It's a great story. The tallest one on the team, Mal was usually in a position to shoot the ball, but would often get fouled. She'd head to the free throw line and almost always miss. But in the final playoff game with the score tied, she went to, the buzzer to, take, a she went to take a buzzer shot, and she was fouled one last time. She found herself back on the three throw line in the swim gym at Beverly High. The entire season was on the line, and I remember looking at her and noticing on the court, across on the other side was Jack Nicholson, who was waiting for his, to watch his son in the next game. In that moment, I thought I was going to barf. So, <laughs> so worried that Mallory would carry the weight of her shoulders if she missed. She picked up the ball, threw it, thre threw it straight in the hoop, and secured the championship. Her competitive spirit, first fierce determination, and natural talent would serve her well for the rest of her short, sweet life. The second story was when Mal was a sophomore in high school. It was the day before the CIF volleyball match, the start of the championship series, and Mal got really sick. She wound up in the ER all night on an IV morphine drip. The next day she wanted to be released so she could support her team, but her doctor said no way. So Mal checked out against AMA, against medical advice. She told me she wanted to suit up to sit with her team. I was worried she'd be too sad, and I kept insisting that she not do that. 
but Mallory didn't listen. The next thing I knew, she was on the court warming up, and then when the whistle blew to start the game, I noticed that she was in the starting lineup. <laughs> I freaked out, but she was determined to play and was on fire that day. Her team advanced to the second round, the first time they'd done that in 14 years. Mal's grit never ceased to amaze me. Hawaii was always Mal's happy place. Our vacations were either to Maui or Oahu. About one particular trip, she wrote this in her journal. When I'm there, I'm in my element. I'm in the sunshine. I'm happy, I sleep well, I'm not stressed. I exude confidence. I'm in the water, I play volleyball, and I surf. And all of these things I do well. There is some combination of factors that makes me stand out in some way, and it makes me easy. It makes it easy for me to meet friends and talk to people, maybe because they start talking to me first, or maybe they smile at me, and it makes me feel they're receptive to me talking. By the end of each, each trip, I'm friendly with the people who work at the rental places and with the people I meet on the beach. This trip, I wasn't with a friend, and it was nice to not feel alone and still have plenty of people to talk to. It struck me as I was returning to California and realizing that a lot of times at Stanford, I feel like an anonymous person. I have some very, very close friends who are so loyal to me and who I love so very much. But in terms of the whole class, I think I'm pretty unknown and don't get out that much and never meet new people. So it's nice for once to feel like people notice me and care that I'm there and I know who I, they know who I am instead of me just being a random person going about my life independently while everyone else goes about their lives independently. Mal was always humble, always modest, never understanding how many loved and admire her or how many were inspired by her life. Until we started transplant process, life seemed manageable. But when it came time for Mal and me to move across the country, we were both scared of the unknown. The best part of this process was meeting the new medical team and finding the most amazing place to live. We set up a life there, and many of our friends and family came to visit. We were happy and hopeful. I would sing to Mal, somewhere over the rainbow, there are lungs. It was my version of prayer. When the transplant finally happened, I changed the lyrics to, somewhere over the rainbow, there were lungs. And the dreams that we dared to dream really did come true. The rainbow became symbolic for all our hopes and dreams. So many people cared about Mal and asked me for updates during the end. It wasn't possible to respond individually, and so I chose Facebook as the way to share her story. All the time people to comment was and continues to be such a gift, as I would share the writings with her. In the beginning, she would smile, and we talk about the comments, but as things progressed, I would read them, and she would muster a smile. I think I lost the last page, which maybe that was not a coincidence because that was the mushy part. Anyway, I lost the last page of my speech. I intended to tell everybody how much we appreciate that you're all here, how difficult this is for us, how Mallory is the most amazing person, and it was a gift to be her mom for all these years. So please don't pity me. If anything, you should be jealous of me. I got to have her. She was my wing kick for all those years. And as I tell all of the girls that are up here and the ones that are out there, I have a lot of mothering left in me to do, so they better let me be part of it their lives. Thank you. Uh, just so people know who's up next, uh, Micah, Merrill, Danny, Dr. Shagian. Is Dr. Mohabir here? Yes, okay, there we go. Um, are up next. Uh, now that we know that uh, Mallory was the Shaquille O'Neal of Beverly Hills High School. Shakamal. Um, Micah? Mallory was my hero. She lived more in 25 years than most do in their lifetime, never once allowing herself to see her sickness as a disability, maintaining a GPA above 4.0 while playing three varsity sports in high school starting her freshman year. Even though she's two years younger than me, I've always looked up to her as a role model in every way. Everything that Mallory, there's, Mallory taught me a lot, far too much to list off here, but what really stuck with me the most was her ability to live in the moment, always taking life one day at a time because she knew that each one might very well be her last. I have no doubt whatsoever that Mallory will continue to influence me in the future. I want my life to be one that would make her proud, as she has always believed in me, even when others did not. I pledge to honor her spirit, day in and day out, in every way I possibly can. Mom and Dad. You gave Mal a better quality of life than any CF patient couldn't have ever asked for. 
Everywhere I look, I see echoes of the sacrifices you have eagerly made in the name of providing a better life, not only for your own daughter, but for countless other children and families facing the same struggles as we have. From annual fundraisers to ensuring that Mallory never spent a single moment alone in the hospital, you've always got the extra mile in every way imaginable, remaining focused and determined when most parents would have thrown up their arms in despair. I know you guys worry about me sometimes and worry that you weren't able to focus enough but I, on me, but I've turned out okay, and I don't want to... <laughs> I turned out okay, and I don't want you guys to ever feel guilty about what you did for Mallory, because I'll be fine. Meryl and Danny, you're on deck. Great. Since we have been instructed to keep this light, I have a couple of silly memories to share. When Mallory came into this world, she followed Micah, who was such an incredibly smart and good-looking boy, and the first grandchild. We bragged about him so much that Diane said, if we keep this up, we're not going to have any friends. I knew that Mallory had a tough act to follow, and I wanted to help Mallory have good self-esteem. So I trained Micah to say, hello, gorgeous, whenever he saw her. Now, around this time, Diane was putting Mallory's hair in a ponytail on top of her head. I'm not sure why this seemed like a good idea. Grandma Flo called it her palm tree. So can you picture this? Mallory with her palm tree head, and Micah saying, hello, gorgeous, in his little kid voice. But the really beautiful thing that I will never forget is the moment when Micah walked into Mallory's hospital room this last week. Despite the fog of heavy medication, Mallory responded to Micah in a way that was unlike anyone else. So Paul and I moved to Sacramento, and I was concerned that Diane's kids would not know me enough to develop a relationship with me. I remember coming to visit when I was pregnant, and I was at that stage where I was nauseated unless I was actively eating. I went straight from the airport to Mallory's gymnastics class, but I dashed out to get some tuna fish and a carton of milk. And when I walked into the studio, I was thrilled that Mallory made a beeline straight to me. I was so excited she knew me until she grabbed the tuna fish and milk out of my hands. She was making a beeline for the food, not Aunt Merrill. Remember when she ate everything in sight? <laughs> Later, when the kids were in high school, we were in Hawaii together along with some friends of hers. And we all know that although Mallory was a very deep thinker, she could also be kind of ditzy. One night after dinner, Mallory said, hey, we should all go stargazing. Marissa Schnittman looked up at the sky, the dark sky, and said, Mallory, there are the, sc the stars, gaze. Some say that when young people leave us too soon, they become one of the stars in the sky. But we know that Mallory is now part of the ocean. I found this quote by JFK Jr. It is an interesting biological fact that all of us have in our veins the exact same percentage of salt in our blood that exists in the ocean. And therefore, we have salt in our blood, in our sweat, and in our tears. We are tied to the ocean. And when we go back to the sea, whether it is to sail or to watch, or I would add to surf, we are going back from whence we came. Salty Mallory, we'll see you when the, sun, when the surf's up. I can't imagine there's much I can say about Mallory that you don't already know. So I'd like to share a little bit what it was like to be in Mal's second family, which is what we think of ourselves as, since Lissa, Sarah, Hannah, and I live in Palo Alto, where Mal spent her college and post-college years. It wasn't long into Mal's college experience that I got an urgent call from Diane asking me to get to Mal's dorm room ASAP. Why? Because Mal had consumed too many brownies
Dye said she was high in puking, the latter being particularly risky for CF patients. So after being reassured by a good friend at Stanford Hospital who ran the adult CF program that Mal would be okay, it spent the night in her dorm room floor. And at that point, I think I earned her trust, and Rira, as I called her, started bringing her friends over to our house to study. As Mal's de disease progressed, she spent an increasing amount of time with us. Since you all know Mallory, I don't have to tell you how great that was. We got even luckier when Mark and Diane came to visit. You can imagine how creatively crazy Aunt Diane, as we affectionately called her, found essential reasons why she needed to visit Palo Alto. So when the Smiths were around, our house resonated with laughter, periods of CF-induced terror, lots of delicious stovetop meals, and plenty of embarrassing questions. Along those lines, once when our girls were entering their teen years, Diane asked Lissa which boys our girls liked in front of Mallory. Mallory, I'm sorry, Lissa said she didn't want to ask them because she wanted to respect their privacy. And without missing a beat, Diane said, privacy? <laughs> Although Diane's response cracked us up and made privacy a reference that lives on, what I remember most about that moment was the look of loving, smiling, loving disgust that passed over Mal's face with an emphasis on the loving part. Mal's affection and appreciation for her mom, her dad, and her brother were readily apparent to all of us. Rira also adored our daughters, and they adored her. Mallory was the perfect role model for them, kind to others, deeply principled, intellectually curious, loyal to her friends, and seemingly unstoppable. In short, the kind of women I hope our kids will grow up to be. We got very lucky when Mal went to Stanford. What I found myself thinking a lot about lately, with more than a little guilt, is that perversely, Mel's illness was our family's blessing. Without CF, we'd never have had so much time with Mallory. Mark, Diane, Dad, Micah, Jack, please know we would trade all that time away in a heartbeat if it meant that Mallory could still be here with us today. Rira, our family will miss you forever. You've made an indelible mark on us, on each one of us, and for that, we are eternally grateful. Dr. Ashagan. everyone. Can you guys hear me? So I'm Patricia Shagan. I am um, one of the people who had the honor and privilege of caring for Mallory. I was one of her CF doctors. Um, unlike a lot of people here, um, I didn't have the opportunity to know Mallory all of her life. Uh, Mal and I met in 2015 um, in the setting of moving back to Los Angeles. And um, that was sort of, I think, the start of her health decline. So I met Mallory in the setting of her lung function starting to decline and having additional health problems related to her cystic fibrosis. And was worried that she was gonna be a challenge to care for. <laughs> um, but I soon, as you can imagine, uh, fell in love with her magnetic personality. And uh, despite all the things I would say to her, she always had a smile on her face for me. Um, and I wanted to just talk to you today about a couple of um, Mallory's personality qualities and things that I admired about her so much. So one was um, Mallory's positive attitude about cystic fibrosis and her perseverance in coping with having this disease. I think when you have an illness, it's very easy to become negative, especially when you hear one of your doctors saying things like, mm, I don't think you should move to Hawaii. Mm, I'm not sure if that's gonna work. Uh, I don't know what we should do. And maybe I should talk to 10 other doctors on the phone about it. Um, she always still had a positive attitude thanking me um, and despite hearing those things, trusting me and um, helping me learn how to care for patients with cystic fibrosis. Finally, the other thing I admired the most about Mallory was her bravery. I think 
that um, you have to be a very brave human being to be able to laugh and joke with your doctor who's about to sedate you and do a procedure on you. Um, she never made me feel um, bad about what was happening with her health and was probably more brave than I would be in her shoes. Um, she also was brave enough not to let CF stop her from contributing to the world and doing the things she wanted to do to be a writer and an editor and contribute to the CF community the way that she did. Um, I think that Mallory was really an inspiration for all of us and I also wanted to share with you a few comments from people who I work with at UCLA who weren't able to be here today. One of our nurses in the ICU said that Mallory's ability to stay positive and focused on getting better even when she had setbacks or a lot of pain was truly amazing. Her family's knowledge about cystic fibrosis allowed them to be true advocates for her and I was always so impressed not only by their knowledge but the fact that they always supported her, never left her alone in the hospital. Someone was always by Mallory's side. Another one of our nurses said, Mallory was a fighter like no one I had ever seen, and we're so sad to hear this news. Finally, one of our young doctors who I'm happy to say is pursuing a career in, in pulmonology after caring for Mallory said that she was one of the most inspiring, sorry, inspiring human beings that he'd ever cared for. And I echo that sentiment. We'll miss her. Dr. Mohabir, followed by Jesse Carlin. I think Jesse Carlin is going to sing immediately afterwards, so if she could get ready. Thank you. Hi. My name is Paul Mohabir. Um, Diane wonderfully asked me to speak and put me in an awkward position. I um, had laryngitis yesterday the last three days, and deliberating, is this going to happen or not? But didn't prepare anything until I was in the plane. So I want to start off with um, addressing something Diane said. I agree and disagree with some of the things you said, and this is often how we started off our clinic visits. Um, <clears throat> I honestly, earnestly believe there were songs of happiness with Diane in Pittsburgh. I saw it every day. What I do not believe is that you were anonymous, and no one knew who you were in Stanford. Everybody knew who you were. I mean everyone. So let's put that out of the way. Um, I'm going to take you into my mind in an experience that I have that not many people will have in this room. We had years together. And there's always this speech I give that this door closing. And it's not what most people think, a door closing to opportunity. It's the sound I hear when I close the door, and it's just me, my mind, and the patient's mind. And Mallory and I have had many moments, so many that it's not even a HIPAA violation, that it can't, you can't comprehend what we talk about. And it's not necessarily life and death. It's what do you want, baby. It's just we would, take, we would tackle everything. But she often said the same thing, which was you know, miraculous to me. How do you feel? I'm good. I'm happy. And she would just, just lunge right into, you know, the volleyball, Maui, the water. And I had a grasp of what she wanted to be happy with. And that's what we use as our foundation to always achieve those things. Time went on. How's it going? I'm good. How's your mom? Well, you know how mom is, right? So, but she was happy and always put that into place. So I believe that happiness transcended throughout all. Things changed at the end. And one day, this is probably the most vivid memory I have of her, is we closed the door again. And this time, it's just the sense was off. And I asked her, so how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I feel happy. So I'm going to ask you that one more time. I'm going to ask with a different tone. How do you feel? After all these years, I couldn't believe it. She melted. She broke down. And she said, I am so happy, but I can't do this anymore. I need help. What did I grasp from that? It's like, you can hold happiness, but my God, we have a tipping point and a weakness point. 
And I think I get to that point with many patients. Sorry, I'm not checking my email. I just want to read you something. We, we get to a point in our life where things change and people acknowledge this. So one of my, um, on the plane here, I was think voice came back. I'm going to say something profound. My favorite author, Nathaniel Hawthorne, American novelist. And I was thinking about something I read years ago, and I said it at my um, father's eulogy, which I really believe it's true. He talked about happiness, and he defined, said happiness is a butterfly by which when we try to pursue it, we always come short of grasping it, but which when we sit quietly, it may alight upon us. So some of you are like, oh my God, that's deep, and others are like, what the hell is he talking about? But I'm gonna go through that. We all have our own trials. I have my trials every day with my life, good and bad, days at work. A couple of, about five years ago, some stuff was going on, and I took upon, some young people may not even know this, but Jerry, Mary J. Blige, and I would sing that song every morning, I just wanna be happy. And I would sing it, I would sing it. And I really didn't find happiness, or maybe I thought I was gonna be like discovered with my voice at that time, but it didn't matter. It didn't change who I was. But when I think about Mallory, it's completely opposite. Diane started this off already, how happy she was up until the transplant. In the clinic, she always said, I am so happy. She had everything. So happiness here is not defined about the transplant and the outcome. If we can only live that every day to say I am happy every single day, we will have a tipping point. We're going to have to deal with that at some point. But to me, that, that's the most moving thing to know. She lived her day with happiness every single solitary time I saw her in clinic. So it's metaphorical, but you're all sitting quietly. That's what she did in the room. Back to Nathaniel Hawthorne. She sat there quietly, and she had that happiness that was bestowed upon her. And I think all of you, if we could appreciate at this moment, you're quietly sitting there and let happiness sit there on us because it's a good time to be happy because she was happy. Secondarily, I'm coming to an end. I want us all to do this exercise, which is so important. I'm going to have a hard time breathing today, but I want us to appreciate what Mallory was trying to appreciate and to love, a breath. It is so vital. And we take it for granted every single solitary day. So if you will, all of you, one on three, just take this big, beautiful breath in from Mallory. I'm going to have you blow it out, okay? One, two, three. Blow it out. You're so clean. And that breath, you just blew that butterfly, Mallory, to Maui. She's on an ocean. She's doing all the things that she wanted to do. I am not sad today. I am trying not to be sad. I feel that there's such greatness that happened here, and she's in a great place. So thank you all for that. Jesse Carlin. I wrote this song for Mallory. She helped me write the lyrics. So this is for you. I may fly lower with my broken wings, but I smile brighter every time I soar. Sometimes I worry if I dream too big. I will shatter like glass The chasing more freedom could poison the rest And I feel wasted And I feel tired And I feel lonely as I Watch friends disappearing and stray In these shackles that chain me to routines Keeping me alive to breathe with clear lungs, but I'm stuck on this line. 
white masks surround me on every front make me feel guilty when I want to run no second chance is all about percent every drop in that sign isolates me from a normal life and I feel wasted and I feel tired and I feel lonely as I watch friends disappearing and strain in these shackles that chain me to routines keeping me alive to breathe once with clear lungs I'm stuck on this line Don't want to drown in myself 60 pills a day, 23 hours to help Got this countdown running in the back of my mind Hope for normal, just wish for normal I may fly lower with my broken wings But I smile brighter every time I soar So I'll feel wasted and I'll feel tired But I'll feel lucky as I Live my life with meaning and strive to be happy Find beauty in the simple things most people fail to find and breathe once Fill my lungs till I jump off the slime Maybe Stacy can figure out how to turn the other mic off. Uh, we're going to now switch over to non-physician, non-immediate family members. Um, the, we're going to start off with the adults. Um, Linda Lichtenberg, Rob Bowie, Bruce Resnikoff, Betsy Streisand, Janet Loeb, and Linda Tyrer in that order. You guys are up next, so please remember. Um, and again, a one-minute limit for everybody, except for me. Um, so a quick story. Uh, this is my wife, Stacy. Um, I, I know what it's like. Don't start the timer yet. I know what it's like being married to a rock star uh, here. Every time I've thought somebody in this room is going to pay me a compliment, it was, I got to tell you, Stacy is so great. And she is. Um, so, um, you yeah, know, we're, we're going to hear lots of stories about Mallory, um, and I will try in advance, not to say anything similar to what anybody else will say. We all know that Mallory was beautiful and athletic and smart and, and brave um, and, and just had an incredible ability to put other people at ease. Uh, she also had two of the characteristics I admire most. She never fetched, um, and she was just an inveterate wise ass, um, which was a big surprise to me, um, but just a great sense of humor. So. When she was younger, um, and uh, you know, we'd go to birthday parties, and we'd go to dinners, and we'd go to events, um, it, it was pretty obvious that Stacy was in the inner circle, and I was not in the inner circle. And I, I did whatever I could to be that rare adult male who made it into Mallory's inner circle. Um, and I, I just could, took advantage of whatever it was that we bonded over. Dogs was probably the first thing. She liked dogs, and I liked dogs, and I would play with her dogs and help her with the dogs. And, and you know, at the end, she would say, that was kind of fun. but..." I still like Stacy better than you. Um, and then um, I introduced her to a couple of guys, and she was incredibly thankful. And she said, I, I got to tell you, very few people do that, and I, I really appreciate it. But I still like Stacy better than you. Um, and then the day you guys left to Pittsburgh, um, the day you guys left to Pittsburgh, I went and I, uh, I, I went over to your house, uh, and I took Mallory aside, and I said, Mallory, I, I got to tell you, I've never met anybody like you before. I, I've met people who are all the characteristics that I named before. Um, you know, again, honorable and brave and smart and, and, and all of these other things. But A, I've never seen anybody who puts it together like you. Uh, and B, I've never seen anybody who had the opportunity to be tested like you had the opportunity to be tested. 
um, and you still perform above anybody else's level. And I, and I just have to tell you, Mallory, I mean, I, I, I've never met a person like you. You are amongst the best, if not the best people I've ever met in my entire life. And I cried a little bit, pretty rare. Uh, she cried. She gave me a hug. She said that was the most emotive I've ever seen you. Uh, I am just so absolutely grateful that you told me that. I still like Stacy better than you. <laughs> and then lastly, lastly, uh, at Jeremiah's wedding, uh, she, she came from from Pittsburgh uh, to Cleveland, uh, and she was sitting there with her, with her um, oxygen tank, and and uh, okay, Stacy's. Uh, I told you it doesn't apply to me. Um, and I came up to her and said, "How are you doing?" And she said, "Why are you asking me how I'm doing? It's your kid's wedding. You should be out there having fun." And I said, "How are you doing?" And she said, "I'm doing great." And she said, "Really?" I said, "Really?" And she said, "Look, you know, I'm doing just fine. Don't worry about me. Worry about yourself." Uh, just, just, just take care of yourself, and how I am really doesn't matter this day. And I said, do you like me as much as Stacy? And she said, just for today, but not really. <laughs> Love you, Mallory. <laughs> Linda Lichtenberg, you are up. One minute rule starts now. I'm Linda Lichtenberg, and Diane asked me to say a few words about uh, her mother, Flo. And I don't know if anybody else here is thinking about Flo. So, oh, uh, Diane asked me to say a few words about Flo, and I don't know if anybody else is, so I might take a minute and a half. I have known Flo for as long as I have known Diane. However, my interactions with her for most of this time was casual and somewhat infrequent. When Diane was pulled away from Los Angeles before Mallory's transplant and needed more hands to help in Flo's life, I had the privilege and honor to, to establish a much closer relationship with her. During the, during the last months of her life, where, not even at her most vulnerable physical state, would she ever focus on her own interests. Flo was always upbeat, positive, and would be more interested in hearing about my life than focusing on her own deteriorating physical condition. She had a simple and uncomplicated way to see life, always solid, sensible, and kind. I believe that Flo saw her illness as a part of life, one that does not need to add any drama or complication. She seemed content and with no regrets. What else can we hope for at the end? Flo was very matter of fact about life in general. When my girlfriend Nell and I went to visit Flo one day, we happened upon the subject of marriage. Nell somehow had the courage to ask Flo if she and Mel had ever seen a marriage counselor in all of their 60 plus years of being together. Flo's response was, no, of course we had our ups and downs, but I love him. I suppose I have a lot to learn in my next 30 years of marriage. One of Flo's major character traits was summed up by her with the words, I don't do sad. Flo never wore her heart on her sleeve, even though she certainly had her fair share of family trials and tribulations over her very long lifetime. I have watched with awe as every member of this family has demonstrated strength, courage, kindness, and unfailing dedication to their beloved Mallory. Flo was the emotional core that created this undying support, and it was her ability to stay calmly centered, regardless of life's hardships that served as a guiding light for all. Both Diane and Mallory were lucky enough to have inherited this unique and special quality, which allowed them to face with grace the challenges that presented themselves. The last time I saw Flo, I experienced firsthand her appreciation for the simple things in life, at the time her mouth was parched and the usual sweets weren't satisfying, I offered her a fudgesicle and watched as her eyes lit up with pleasure. I haven't had one of those since I was a little girl, she said, and she thoroughly enjoyed that special treat. This reaction epitomizes Flo's entire approach to living, simple, sensible, appreciative, and satisfied with whatever life offered in the moment. I admire Flo and Diane's way of looking at life and have seen and learned from our unforgettable, perfect Mallory for the prescription of living life at its fullest. Um, that was the flow exception to the one minute rule. There will be no other exceptions. Um, Rob, one minute. So I'm sure everyone here knew 
or knows what a great athlete Mallory was, what a talented writer, how much she loved the ocean and, and to surf. But I don't think many of you know what a great bartender she was. And this is in high school. So her specialty was the mojito. And at one of Diane's famous Sunday night dinners, Mal must have served me and Mike Margolin about five each. And uh, that was a very fun night because Mal didn't skimp on the rum when she made her mojitos. Um, she was such a stickler for quality control that she made sure and taste tested each one <laughs> before she gave it to you. She'd take a nice, long, slow sip out of a colorful straw and say, yeah, it's good. <laughs> and it always was. And she'd start laughing like crazy after that. Um, and there's so many things I'm going to miss about Mallory. Uh, the way she used to, to type on an imaginary uh, typewriter when you talk to her, like she's transcribing your, your uh, conversation. The way she'd half hum, half sing tunes that might be on the radio or you know, partly she made up herself. And if, you, if she noticed you seeing her do that, she'd stop, but then start right back up again. Um, <laughs> and how smart, how... how how uh, kind she was. But then there was her laugh, and her laugh was just a great laugh. She had the kind of laugh that made you have to laugh along with her um, when she laughed. And back in the, her bartending days um, at Diane's Sunday dinners, I'd always be seated on the kid's side of the table for some reason. And um, the best seat in the house was always right next to Mal because that's where all the laughter was. And she'd, she'd uh, laugh the whole dinner. And sometimes she'd be laughing hysterically for two or three minutes. And then she'd say, I don't get it. <laughs> and then Mark or Micah or me would explain the joke, and she'd go, oh. And then she'd start up all over again and laugh even harder. So just to close here, um, Mal wrote that we're all miracles crafted from stardust. Uh, all of us are made of part of the same celestial soup, which means her spirit, her energy, her soul are all going to be a part of all of us forever. And I like to think at least one small part of her is back out there with the stars, probably surfing on a comet, taking in a long, slow sip of that cosmic cocktail that makes up all of us and everything. And she's saying, yeah, it's good. And then she laughs. Love you, Mel. Okay, that was the high school coach exemption from the one-minute rule. <laughs> Clearly harking back to a more innocent time where high school teachers and coaches and underage kids drank um, <laughs> on, on Sunday nights at the Smith household. <laughs> Imagine today. All right. Bruce Resnikoff, you are going to be the first person for whom the one-minute rule is strictly enforced. Strictly. So just start off with the end. <laughs> This is my daughter, Nikki, who is one of a group of girls who has known Mallory virtually since they, virtually since they came out of the womb. Um, it's impossible, first of all, to honor the memory of Mallory without also honoring the entire Smith family. I really believe each of us here is a better person because of Mallory, a better sibling because of Micah, and every parent here is a better parent because of Diane and Mark. Um, I want to expand for a moment on Diane's basketball story, which uh, she told part of it. Um, in 2006, my daughter Nikki asked me to coach her basketball team. I immediately went to Mark Smith and said, let's coach basketball together. Now, those of you who know Mark know he's probably the smartest person in the world, and the first person you go to when you have a complicated corporate real estate transaction, or if you need a traffic school certificate. without going to traffic school. <laughs> but I had no idea if he could coach basketball. It didn't matter because along with Mark came the secret weapon, Mallory Smith. Mallory Smith, who was brilliant, athletic, a role model, and a fighter, but most importantly at that moment, about a foot taller than the rest of the girls. 
Yes, Mark, uh, as creepy as it sounds, I could now admit that I used you to get my hands on your daughter. <laughs> of course, Mark and I had no real strategy that season. Our game plan was simple. Mallory stood near the basket. Mallory held her arms high above her head. <laughs> and everybody passed the ball to Mallory and yelled, shoot. <laughs> she couldn't really shoot well, but she also set a Beverly Hills record for rebounds by rebounding her own shots that year. Um, no one could stop uh, Mallory that year. They really tried. They pushed her, they grabbed her, they double teamed her, they triple teamed her. They even did everything they could to make her back down, but Mallory never quit. She was relentless, at times unstoppable, and a, as any great leader, found ways to get the ball to her teammates and lift everyone's game. During that season, we may not have been the best team, and Mark and I certainly weren't the best coaches. But not surprisingly, when the playoffs came, the time that winners step up, as Diane said, Mallory led our team to the Beverly Hills Basketball League title. So in the fall of 2006, just as she would do throughout her entire life, Mallory Smith, who stood taller than the rest, who never quit, who was relentless, unstoppable, and the ultimate team player, was a champion. That's the Mallory Smith I know, that's the Mallory Smith I love, and that's the Mallory Smith I will always remember. We're getting closer. Jan. Oh my God, no notes. Maybe we have a shot of being under a minute. No, I just speak from the heart. That's my thing. Um, I'm Jan Beyer, a very good friend of Diane's, and I became Mallory's fairy godmother almost by accident, but it ended up being something that I continued to do over the years. It started with the prom dress in the hospital. I was very concerned that Mallory had the right prom dress, so we talked about it, and I ended up delivering her this very, very nice black prom dress. In the end, typical Mallory, she ended up deciding, no, that wasn't really the right dress for her. She needed to be having an ethereal white dress. And at this, um, with this white dress, she became her, the famous prom queen, <laughs> which I love. And because I don't have children myself, Mallory kind of became my adopted daughter. And I could not have been more proud of her in her white ethereal dress that she, she had the honor of prom queen. And this continued on when she went to Stanford. There was, I talked to Diane on the phone. She said, Mallory has a formal coming up. I don't know what she's going to wear. I said, no problem. I live in San Francisco. I put in the back of my car about 10 dresses, drove down to the Stanford Shopping Center, met Mallory in the parking lot. And she, I said, okay, Mallory, here we go. So we kind of went over in the corner, and I held up my coat, and she kind of tried all the dresses on in the parking lot and ended up with one that she ended up wearing not only to the formal, but to other events because I saw lots of pictures in that great dress. So I just, I have, a, I have a very special fondness for Mallory in my heart that goes beyond that. I ended up getting to know Jack. We went to a San Francisco Giants game when they were at Stanford. And I just continued kind of to want to wanna be Mallory's kind of pseudo mom. So I just feel so thankful to, to have been in her life and for her to have been in mine, she was a cool girl. That's all I can say, a cool girl. Like, I, I got her spirit. And she was an old soul, and I will miss her. And I love that girl so much. Getting close. Uh, Betsy. Do I really see eight pages? I think I've gotten it down to about 3.45. Oh, hold on, sorry. Yep. So I, I was very happy that Diane asked me to come here and say something about Mallory as, and, as a writer. By 25, Mallory had written 
one book, was at work on another one, maybe two, made a film, a radio documentary, posted a long list of pieces, list of pieces on sites like Medium, kept years of journals, and probably did much more than that. I probably should have been getting writing advice from her. Mallory, but here's the thing. Mallory had something to say. She had a lot to say. She was a lovely and ambitious writer. She was full of ideas and the possibility that she could bring about change, heal the planet in some way through her words and her work, protect her precious Hawaii. But most of all, she was honest and brave and unrelenting when it came to telling her own story. As she put it in one of her posts, I am limited in what I can do, but not in what I can say. She left behind a chronicle of a real life, of a girl trying to make sense of the world and her place in it. Of a girl who at age 11 learned that Sapatia had taken up residence in her body and changed the calculation of her future. Or to paraphrase Mallory, a girl who through a random encounter with an opportunistic pathogen had walked up to the devil's vending machine and was now expected to feel the heaviness of a mortality consciousness. Who writes like that at 24? Mallory understood that she understood something that few of us do. She didn't choose it, but she stood defiant in front of that vending machine, and she told her story. She was disciplined about her writing. She was disciplined about her happiness. She didn't know the meaning of self-pity. She celebrated the good. She made no bones about the bad. She dared us all to learn the weaponized language of CF. She questioned the tragic bargain that would bring her new, the new lungs she needed. Truth is under assault every day in this country. Mallory left behind something honest and real, a compelling and heart-wrenching collection of pieces. She said writing healed her in many ways. Her writing will surely heal others. I had secretly hoped that I would be the person to produce the first radio piece Mallory made with her new lungs when she could breathe deeply enough for the demands of audio. Sadly, we won't get to make that piece. But for all of those who knew her well, and far better than I, and with all due respect to E.B. White, I offer the last line of Charlotte's Web. It is not often that someone comes along who is a true friend and a good writer. Mallory was both. You did good. Linda Tyrer. Diane and I have been friends for many years. We became particularly close on our morning walks where we used our time together as a therapy session. And of course, raising our sons and daughters, we needed that friendship therapy. We have shared many moments of joy and pain and laughter and sorrow, none of which I will be able to discuss with you because we have our pinky swear agreement. What is said on the walk stays on the walk. I spent the last two weeks in Pittsburgh with Mark, Diane, and Mallory as well as the charismatic Cooper dog. <laughs> And I want to share with you what it was like to be there with them during this incredibly difficult time. While Mark took the night shift, Diane and I spent the days with Mallory in the hospital. As many of you have experienced, one of Mallory's amazing qualities was that she made you feel so at ease, even amidst the mayhem of a hospital room. And even though she was in much discomfort, she was, as always, brave and positive, polite and sweet, regardless of all that was happening around her. Watching Diane and Mallory together was something special. Their relationship transcended the usual mother-daughter connection. They were a team, and it was inspiring to watch. Diane, the fierce mama bear, you do not mess with her, was also the confidant, friend, advisor, and especially the cheerleader. She was definitely the fun mom, but also the gatekeeper and taskmaster. As for Mallory, I want everyone to know that in spite of all that was going on around her and with her. There were many laughs these past two weeks. We talked about friends and TV shows, food and fashion, annoying nurses, how awful nausea is, 
how she had no regrets, how she was looking forward to seeing Jack and that she missed her naughty dog, Cooper, and her brother, Micah. We had a nice distraction when my daughter, Emily, came for a quick visit, and she and Mallory got to talk about their overbearing moms. We laughed uncontrollably when Mallory got caught trying to take a secret video of Diane doing the YMCA in the room. <laughs> there were foot rubs and walks in the hallways and gossiping about handsome doctors behind their backs. We laughed that every single time she put on her headphones to watch an episode of The Good Wife, she would immediately be asked a question and have to put it on pause. She never ever got annoyed with her mom who lovingly and endlessly fussed over her except for the big eye roll when Diane mentioned on the phone to a reporter that Mallory was her high school prom queen. <laughs> we laughed that the second we decided on what we should order for lunch, we would then start talking about what we should order for dinner. What I want you to know is that there were so many normal moments during such a scary and stressful time, even though it was becoming apparent. that the beast of Asia might win the war. Diane and Mark never let Mallory give up hope. They made her life as comfortable and fun and easy as possible, not just these past weeks and months, but for all of her 25 spectacular years. They are truly remarkable parents. Mallory was special in every way. And like all of us, I will be forever grateful to have been lucky enough to spend time with her. Thank you. Um, there's apparently one more adult on the program. Uh, by the way, there are about six or seven chairs up here if anybody in the back wants to sit down. Um, now, one more adult on the program whose name hasn't been mentioned yet. Um, so Janet Loeb, you're up. And Susan, you're up immediately after. I love the look of that page. <laughs> she, <clears throat> she writes because she doesn't want to forget anything. As time goes on, what was once the vivid, the real, the present becomes slippery and vague and trickles away like water cupped in the hands, but anything written isn't going anywhere. Mallory's words. And if words could paint a thousand pictures, then the visual embodiment of Mallory's work could populate a museum. I had the privilege of working with Mallory, curating a project that shares the works and stories of patients living with life-altering conditions. Mallory was crucial in initiating the project as it went through various iterations. With her help, we launched a pro the project, and it was called Art Healing Artists. And we created exhibitions of the work of artists living with cystic fibrosis. Not only did she bring the artists together, but her writing was the glue that connected their stories, teaching others about the disease and its impact on their lives. And she did all this despite everything else going on in her life. I, I, I could tell you so many wonderful stories of working with her and how pleasant she is, just how her sense of humor. We've heard so many of these stories, but her experiences and what they gave to this project um, were amazing. And they taught her to accept challenges with grace, to embrace the good, and to work for change. Her work emanated from a deep understanding of the world, her place in it, and the knowledge that how she dealt with her circumstances could deeply impact those around her. Through her writings, she left us an enduring gift. She wrote, I found that such is the task of a writer, to help others understand and empathize with a life experience they've never lived. Work hard at empathy, and two things will happen. First, you will feel better with your existence, about your existence. Second, you will find that you're not so alone after all, and that there's always someone to turn to, even if it's just the blank page and the blinking cursor.
Thank you, Susan. My name is Susan Gottlieb. You may have heard of me. I work for Mallory's mom. <laughs> oh, excuse me. She works for me. I forgot. I did not know Mallory until she was in her teens. By then, she had developed into a competent, mature, articulate, and extremely bright teenager. I had followed Mal's progress through high school and Stanford and re read many of her writings. When I decided it was time to get serious about writing a book about the Gottlieb Garden, Mallory was one of many writers competing to put the story into words. Without too much bias on my part, it was decided that Mallory would do the job. Of course, when you hire Mallory, hire Mallory, you get two for the price of one, if you get my meaning. Sometimes you get three for the price of one, when you include her brilliant father. She was an absolute joy to work with, a real professional with an amazing work ethic. We produced a beautiful, incredibly well-received book, which I see as part of her legacy. I will be forever grateful to have known and worked with her. To me, Mallory was like a shooting star. She flashed into our lives, stayed a moment, dazzling us with her brilliance, and then darted away, leaving us with beautiful memories. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. We are now going to shift generations, um, and hopefully I will have greater luck intimidating people under 30 than I have people over 30. Um, I will, the first two groups of people going are Talia Stone and Gabby Hefesey, and they will be followed, just so you guys have warning, by Michelle Wolf and Bo Abrams, Talia and Gabby. <laughs> Hi, I'm Talia. And I'm Gabby. We've been best friends with Mallory since kindergarten. September marked 20 years as the Three Musketeers. We feel eternally grateful that we were able to spend so much time with Mallory. When we were together, an outsider looking in would think we were crazy, blasting songs, singing at people as we drove down the street, wearing Gabby's crazy clothes, dancing around the room, and talking to strangers. <laughs> Honestly, it didn't matter what we were doing. We'd always laugh until we cried. We all know Mallory as the brilliant, compassionate, positive person, but she did have some very, very quirky habits. For example, her typing fingers, Rob, that originated in fourth grade as we did type to learn with Mr. P. We were always a little different. While other kids went outside or to the cafeteria for recess and lunch, we sought refuge from the outside. When Mallory went to the nurse for her enzymes, we followed and convinced Nurse Didi to let us eat in her office. Or we graded papers for our favorite teachers in exchange for them letting us eat inside. In middle school, we became hall monitors, otherwise known as eagles. Pretty much our dream came true because every day was an indoor eating party. We were always a little different. While other kids played with toys, we built rides for Mallory's cats. We tied a rope around the stair balcony and connected it to a basket filled with blankets so the cats would, of course, be comfortable. We'd raise and lower the cat like an elevator. We were so inventive. One time, Diane walked in, startled and knowing that we were misbehaving, we dropped the rope with the cat in it at the top of the stairs. <laughs> Don't worry, the cat loved it. We were always a little different. Mallory was a great writer, and one time she used her special talent coupled with Talia's schemy personality to make me a J-date profile and not tell me for months. <laughs> it started by saying, hola muchachos, I'm Gabby, a spunky, funky Argentinian chica born and raised in Beverly Hills. <laughs> Ultimately, we were raised together and we raised each other. We shaped our personalities around each other, so Mal will always be a part of us. Her light will never fade as she lives in all of us and guides us through. So every time we look at the sky and see those bright stars, or look at the ocean and see that glisten on the water, we will know that is her sparkle and there will always be her sparkles. 
Breathe easy and rest in peace, Mel. We will always love you. Uh, Michelle and Bo and Danielle Jonas, you are up next. Hello, everyone. I'm Michelle. It's incredible to see the outpouring of support for the Smith family and be here today with all of you to celebrate our dear friend Mallory. Mal and I first met when we were five years old and played on the Purple Pony soccer team. I remember Mallory got to play on two soccer teams that year, our purple team and a yellow team. I asked my mom why this was, and my mom told me that Mallory was very special and needed to do more exercise to keep healthy. I didn't think much of it then, and years passed until we would be teammates again in high school. That was when our friendship blossomed from playing volleyball together. We would spend hours hanging out both on and off the court, eating copious amounts of food. My favorite times were spent eating in Diane's kitchen, all those salads and baked goods. Um, we also laughed at the silliest things and had fun doing both everything and nothing. We stayed in close contact after high school when we both went to college in Northern California. And our friendship since endured times of health and sickness, boyfriend, up and downs, more volleyball, an amazing trip to Hawaii, telling funny stories and having conversations about life in a few different hospitals, and a shared interest in making a difference in the CF community. One of Mal's qualities that never went unnoticed for me was that she cared so deeply for those around her. Mal valiantly fought her battle with CF and with her family raised millions of dollars to support research for the rare bacteria she acquired. But Mal's vision was bigger than raising money to just help herself. As she inched closer to needing a double lung transplant, she aspired to use her community to raise money to fund organ rejection research, which would benefit the entire CF community. Bo and I wanted to help her in any way we could, and when the Smiths made the move to Pittsburgh after Mallory was finally listed for transplant, Lunges for Lungs was born. In the last three months, we've done a lot of lunges, spread awareness about CF and organ rejection, and raised over $85,000 to fund research. <laughs> I'm almost done. It breaks my heart that Mallory isn't here today to lunge with us, laugh with us, and celebrate the profound impact she had on all of us. When I was with her in Pittsburgh last week, she was so happy to see so many of her friends visiting her. And as we talked about, and as we talked about future plans to go back to Hawaii, hang out, eat, and do all the things we always did, she put her hand on her heart and crossed her fingers that it would happen soon. In one of her blog posts, Mal wrote, give back what we have taken by paying it forward. Give back in whatever small way you can, anytime you can, because we are not small. No one of us can do everything, but all of us can do anything. Mal, Bo and I promise to keep giving back through lunges for lungs and in whatever ways we can. You were right, we are not small. The community here today of people that you brought together is not small. Looking out, it's so obvious to me that Mallory made the biggest impact on all of us and i just wanted to thank her for being an amazing friend your spirit is with me everywhere i go and i plan on bringing a little bit of you to everything that i do i'm gonna try to truncate this to avoid willy wonka and the skinny jeans <laughs> these are my baggy jeans <laughs> So pardon me if I jump around a bit. Mallory, I think I can speak on behalf of everyone here when I say your writing is special, almost indescribably so, but we'll get to that. What makes you special to me is much more effortless. I remember going over to your house as a kid, you would have this contraption on this vest and these machines, and you know, as a four-year-old, you'd turn the corner and she'd just be like vibrating you know, really quickly, and you'd start really close to freaking out, and then she'd just give you a big smile, and of course, everything was okay. 20 years later, it didn't matter if you were at UCLA, Stanford, Pittsburgh, you didn't really know what to think, you didn't know necessarily what was going on, you'd turn the corner, Diane be in there, and look at Mallory, and she'd smile at you, and everything would be okay. Now I'll address what I'm sure to be a completely packed house, surprise. <laughs> Mallory was popular, like big time popular, and as you can imagine for Diane, scheduling all the visitors and visits required intense time management. So I'd text Diane to Mal and say I was free to come by on a particular day or weekend, and Diane would promptly schedule me to come in for 30 minutes or so before Mallory would have some sort of therapy. <laughs> For the first 30 minutes or so, we just talk about whatever, um, girls, boys, anything. <laughs> just girls and boys, as you can tell. 
Um, and then I'd notice after 30 minutes, the, the nurses would come in and she'd have a therapy where she couldn't speak. And, you know, Diane would warn me and say, Bo, she can't speak, you know, so just, just talk for an hour straight. And I was like, <laughs> I started to notice a pattern. It was like I was, became Mallory and Diane Schmoozer. Like she would literally just schedule me in for these big, long talks. <laughs> Um, and it was funny because Mallory even, right, Diane would be like, all right, I'm going downstairs. And then Mallory would be like, <laughs> she'd be like, okay, but I can't talk, so just, just go ahead. And I'd like say something. I told her a story about like how I took a surfboard to the face in Costa Rica, and she'd just be like through the ventilator like, that's hilarious. <laughs> she just didn't want me to feel bad about my flat joke. <laughs> um, Mal, while I relish how simply you made people feel at all times your writing is something to be revered as it is in this moment, there's a consensus favorite piece that seems to be everywhere now. You know, the one where you talk about how lucky we are to be here in this universe. Intelligent beings with purpose and intention. The result of exploding stars millions of years ago which make up the individual atoms that form us. You remind us that even if we feel small in the universe, that we are made up of these giant stars merely by chance. And that therefore we should feel big. Well, if we are approaching this mathematically and scientifically, then I agree we're lucky to be here. And I'm even luckier to have ended up across the street from you 20 years ago. And maybe physics can even explain the reason we're all here now. You are and always were the biggest, brightest star, and as such, had the strongest gravitational pull, drawing us in and allowing us to orbit around and bask in your light. Thank you for starting Lunches for Lungs with Michelle and me, and thank you for personally thanking each of the hundreds of people who posted videos for the campaign. I can't tell you how many people felt like superstars for that. I found a purpose I didn't know existed, and sharing your story continues to raise funding to combat CF and lung transplant rejection. Thank you for inspiring me to become an organ donor. I'm sure I'm not the only one that was moved to sign up after you posted about its importance. I promise we are not done, and I do not like to think it is a stretch to say that because of you, the people in this room now will feel responsible to try and eradicate CF from this planet. I'm so proud to have you, Micah, Mark, and Diana's family, if they have room for the goofy kid across the street. This now giant family will make sure to let the world know about your light, and we will use it to make the world more like it should be, like you, Mallory. Willy Wonka. Um, all right. Danielle Jonas, followed by Alex Rosenthal. Alex, you may as well get up as well. Yeah. My relationship with Mallory began in high school on the volleyball court. Being two years older than Mal, we anxiously awaited her entrance into the gym for tryouts. We could not wait to have her height in the front row. While her athleticism was impressive, her spirit, perseverance, and dedication immediately became the heart of our team. I still get chills thinking about Mallory walking into the swim gym as our playoff game was starting with her hospital wristband still on her wrist and a smirk on her face. She subtly mentioned that she'd left the hospital against medical advice and joined us in our team warm-up. Only years later did I fully understand how insane it was that she played in that game. Mallory, wise beyond her years, immediately became one of my dearest friends and confidants. It's hard to put into words the way that Mallory and her family have touched my heart, influenced my work and personhood, and motivated my goals and passion. Only those who have had the pleasure of knowing Mallory can fully understand the person she was, how her smile lit up any room, how her hugs cured all ailments, how her eyes twinkled just thinking about the ocean, how she had a way of writing about her life and disease that spoke to the deepest part of your heart, in a way that inspired you to be the best person that you could be every day, and how she empathized with anyone, no matter how small or silly their problem, from her hospital bed as she was quite literally fighting for her life. Mal, I already miss your honest and direct feedback, endlessly compassionate heart, incredibly detailed memory, and genuine positive regard and enthusiasm. It is also difficult for me to fully articulate the admiration I feel for Mark and Diane and the way that they walk to the ends of the earth for their daughter. I have never witnessed a love and a fight quite like this one, and I am certain that I never will again. As I've embarked on my journey as a pediatric palliative care social worker, I've found myself bringing Mallory and her story along with me in every step. I find myself beaming with pride as I share who she was and what she has accomplished. My friend Mallory has CF, is colonized with Bisapatia and graduated from Stanford. I brag proudly and often. In the past week, I have had numerous pediatric physicians, social workers, nurses, and chaplains that I work with reach out and tell me 
that they've been following her story, and that Mallory has made them a better clinician. And they never even got to meet her. Just yesterday, the head cystic fibrosis physician at Boston Children's Hospital reached out to me and asked about Mallory's course and revolutionary treatments that she received at the end of her life, sharing that he wants to use her experience to learn more about how he can help his patients with Cepatia live better and longer. Mallory, your story is truly unbelievable. The amount of lives you have touched is enormous. The love in this room is tangible and remarkable. I know that I am far from alone in saying that you will remain in my heart for the rest of my life, and I feel lucky beyond measure to have you as my forever hero. Uh, Alex and then Natasha, and sorry to do this, but the powers that be have asked me to ask each of you to shorten your remarks. Um, I'm going to let everybody know at one minute when they've hit the one minute mark, and then you'll have 30 seconds left to go. These are all great stories, but if we don't do that, we're just going to have to cut off the number of people who speak. So you're first. I'm a friend of uh, both Micah and Mallory's from high school. And so it won't surprise many of you to know that the first myth that I met was Diane. Um, and my friendship with both of them seemed to always somehow include her parents, whether, we had, whether it was because we had uh, rented a house in Big Bear in high school and spent a weekend there only to find out that Mark had also rented an apartment nearby, or whether Mike and I had thrown a party in high school that got broken up because of a not-so-anonymous phone call from Diane to the police. When I will remember Mal, I'll remember how much she had a full life, how much joy she had, how many friends she had, how much she read and loved, and how much we argued. When I, was, when I will remember Mallory, I won't just remember how lovely she was, but how lovely she made us and how lovely she made me. Mal never saw the worst of people because they were always the best versions of themselves when they were around her. And, they, and she made us even better versions of ourselves. Mal taught us at once how to take life more seriously and live it more lovingly. She taught us that pain and suffering can be conquered by love and friendship. She proved the power of presence and the power of community. She made us all better people. And many in this community know each other or call each other friends because of their connection to Mal. She didn't only make people better, she made this community better. And so despite her illness, it is hard not to be jealous of her life, of the way she lived it, and of the impact she had. In a shortened lifetime, she lived longer and fuller than the rest of us ever may, with more friends and more happiness. Mal lived 10 lives, she made hundreds of lives better, and her legacy will save lives. Excellent, nice job. Natasha Charente, Charente? Uh, and Ali Epstein, you're next. I will let you know when you've hit one minute. All right. <laughs> Um, I wrote on my phone, I had actually prepared this vomit bag in the plane, but I left it behind, so hopefully it makes someone joyful. Um, Mallory to me was like a journey. Being friends with her was a constant adventure, and in the high, like in the lows, she would always put that smile on <clears throat> and say a book-worthy word. <clears throat> Mallory had the gift of making everything seem almost normal. And she taught me to care less about what people thought and embrace it all. And so we did. From the time we almost got arrested in Vegas, <laughs> um, to, the <clears throat> to all those nights at the Smith's kitchen table, from that Hawaiian escapade to Diane's amazing talk about dating and who was a cutie in town, <laughs> we took every second and lived it to the fullest. I do have to say, though, there is one thing I never was able to embrace, and that was when she would pee in the pool. <laughs> we eventually trained her to do, we eventually tried her to do it in the corner, but she was always so honest about it. <laughs> when I first moved to LA, she actually asked me, at first, I wasn't sure if something was wrong with you or if you were just foreign. She made me laugh so much. Um, I loved everything about Mal, her family, her friends, her humor, 
even those mucus pictures I had to take to send to Diane so we could acknowledge a little whoop whoop. <laughs> or sometimes if the picture was really good, a little dance that looked like this. I'll miss you, Mal. I just want to say I hope we can all make her proud. Aloha, Mallory. Thank you for all the amazing journeys. Um, Mal, remember that time we sat on the couch and watched Mamma Mia on repeat for an entire year in high school? Of course you do, but I had to bring it up because Diane told me to. Right now, it feels seemingly impossible to recalculate all that you've taught me and convey how grateful I am for the last 10 plus years of friendship on one page. So thank goodness I was asked to share one funny story. Looking back on all my favorite funny memories with you, most of them include food and us peeing together in the most obscure and random places all over town. It was, <coughs> it was always a rough time eating with you because most of the time I felt like I was the one gaining most of the weight. But, <laughs> but peeing all over town was one of the most hilarious ways you probably left your mark. <laughs> Mal, you're one of the most beautiful, courageous, and loving friends I've ever had. You've forever marked your territory on my heart and on the greater Los Angeles area. I love you with all my heart, Mally. Me, right? Great. All right. Um, Mal and I had a somewhat embarrassing nickname for each other. Um, this is not meant to be sexual at all, but we called each other balls. <laughs> it started off with my calling her Malls Balls, and then she started calling me Alls Balls, and then it just became Balls, and it was down the rabbit hole from there. I don't think I've actually called her Mal in almost three years. Mal was an incredible person, but incredible seems unfair because it doesn't do her justice. Incredible doesn't encompass the unbelievable empathy she had toward other people and their problems, even when she had so many of her own. It doesn't capture the strength that kept her fighting for 25 years. It doesn't express the wisdom she had beyond her young age. It doesn't encapsulate the talents, the brilliance, the kindness, the joy, the energy, or the bravery that made up who she was. It was almost exactly eight years ago when we met, and those eight years changed who I was and how I saw the world. Mallory wasn't a victim, though she had every right to be. There was never a why me. There was only a zest for life and an urge to fight. She never gave up, ever and she seized every moment she ever had. She taught me how to squeeze every single bit out of life, even when it doesn't always give you much to work with. The day before Mal landed, day before Mal landed, is that better? Okay. The day before Mal landed in the ICU, she texted me that friends like all of us made her want to keep fighting. That's another thing about Mal, her friends. She gravitates toward the most unbelievable people and somehow finds a way to bring them all together. Mal was the most inclusive person I have ever met, and I can thank her for introducing me to friends of hers that I know will now be lifelong friends of mine. Okay, so I lied about the nickname Balls not being sexual. Um, it wasn't meant to be, I promise, but then we decided that we had to pick which ball we were. So then I became left ball and she became right ball. <laughs> I'm cutting you off on that. No, I, I, I promise, I'm really, I'm really close. Um, and, that is just, <laughs> and that is just completely symbolic of our friendship. Mallory was my other half, my best friend, my confidant, the person I went to for any of all advice. She was my person, and I'm a better human, a calmer human, and a richer human because of her. When I said goodnight to her last Saturday night in the ICU, I left her room with an I love you, and she mouthed love you around her ventilator. Those were the last words she said to me, and I will cherish those words forever. I love you, Mal. David Hammerman, you're up after Maya. So Mal was a weirdo, as many of us know, but the weird parts of us were the same. We loved belting out the Rent soundtrack in the dorm showers. We were both long-limbed and really clumsy, and we were very gullible. Well, some people call it gullible. I like to think of it as optimistic. We would essentially believe anything people told us, just instantly so wide-eyed and so excited. And speaking of excited, um, I'm actually excited to share that I have the backstory on what Mal's uncle Danny shared about the pot brownie story. So I was Mal's roommate sophomore year. 
Um, and so our neighbor Andrew had these, these special brownies. He had these pot brownies. And so Mal decided that she wanted a little taste of them. Um, but after a few hours, Mal wasn't feeling anything. And so she was super confused. So she asked him for another taste. And he was like, okay, but I, I think it might hit you soon. And I was like, no, 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 it's, I, don't, I don't feel anything, so it's not hitting me. And so he succumbed and he gave her more. And then she said she still wasn't feeling it, so he gave her even more. Pretty soon, Mal was feeling it. As you can imagine, she was really, really feeling it. So much so that Mal's uncle Danny was called to the dorm by Diane and Mark. Um, and Danny ended up sitting by her bed that night. Um, and so Mal never lived that down. That was one of our favorite stories. But what I took away from it would, was that it just showed that Mal would run full throttle at experiences. She would take the men, no holds bar, um, no holding back. And she just approached everything so wholeheartedly, um, especially her friendships. And I was really lucky to be one of the recipients of that and to be one of Mal's best friends. So. You guys both went to Stanford with Mal? Incredible how the Stanford people set, set the standard for inappropriateness. It's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> All right, David Hammerman followed by Becca Sadwick. Jesse, you're in my story, so let the minute slide. You get a minute. Thanks. Hi, hello, everybody. I'm David Hammerman, or as Diane may have introduced me at the time, or a thousand Mallory's future husband. A few years ago, a few years ago, Jesse called me, telling me that he had the most incredible girl for me to meet, and that she would change my life. He went on to describe how smart, beautiful, and just amazing she was. Needless to say, that woman was Mallory. A few days later, I was meeting this strikingly beautiful woman at Superba, and over a two and a half hour dinner, I was blown away by her charm, ability to listen, and her smile. I'll let you guys all in on a little bit of a secret. Considering I'm here today with my loving boyfriend, Kyle, who's sitting there next to me. <laughs> I can say the reason that we didn't work out was 100% of me and not her. Well, while I may not have met the love of my life that night, I met someone who I will love for the rest of my life. Con considering I met Mallory on somewhat false pretenses, I thought it would only be appropriate to tell the story of how I came out to her. It was in February of 2016, and Mallory was at UCLA in Santa Monica. I went over to the hospital, a complete sweaty mess, which was only compounded by the fact that Diane refused to leave us alone for more than 20 seconds. <laughs> After Mallory very forcefully <laughs> told Diane to take a lunch break and that she'd be safe with me, I gave Mallory the details of my previous few months, which involved lots of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or EDM music, an ill-fated trip to Mexico, and ultimately how I came to terms with my sexuality. Mallory looked at me with her mouth agape and burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> when she stopped, she looked at me, and pardon the French, but these are Mallory's words, not mine. You've got to be shitting me. You made that all up. <laughs> I told her, no, <laughs> I'm not that creative, and maybe we should turn it into a movie. My joke wasn't that funny, but she went into a bit, a bit of laughter so hard that the monitors started going off. A nurse came in to check on her, a fact that we've kept from Diane to this day, so I didn't get banned from the hospital in the future. <laughs> when she settled down, she had me come over and gave me a big air hug. That moment right there was when I knew I had a special friend. Mallory had every right to have felt guilty, like I had lied to her and to be angry with me, and instead she showered me with love, acceptance, and laughter. Mallory, you were a unique soul. You saw the world for all of its absurdity, and you chose to fight and live as long and as forcefully as you could. I'll end with a line from a note that I wrote Mallory <laughs> to last Sunday. Mallory, I love you, and I'm grateful for the effect you've had on me. I consider myself a very lucky man to have gotten the chance to be part of your life. There was no way I was going to interrupt that story. Um, all right, Becca, Marissa, and Jason Bellett, you guys are up in rapid fire order. Oh my God, that's long. Yeah, so I heard one page and I thought I would just point five margins I'll, it, I'll but joke's on me. So, uh, Diane and Mark, I will email this to you. Trying to capture the life and essence of such an extraordinary person seems impossible, though that's somewhat fitting given how many times Mallory and her incredible family did the impossible. From providing a 
a life that she described with gratitude as incredible and fun and filled with awe and surprise, despite the challenges CF posed, to finding treatment options that defied medical knowledge and training, including breakthroughs that may very well change medical science forever. Mallory came from a family of miracle workers who are ensuring that her legacy of helping others is continued. Every aspect of my life is changed for the better for having known Mallory, as I'm sure is true for so many of us. I wouldn't have met my fiance Tyler if it weren't for her, and she was the first person he confided in for relationship advice. Mal encouraged Tyler to just go for it and ask me out, though she never betrayed his confidence by relaying any of this to me. She was an incredible listener and friend. We talked about the creative ways to ensure you'd be a bridesmaid in our wedding, regardless of where you were, Mal even suggesting getting your hair and makeup done if you were in the hospital in Pittsburgh and piping you through on an iPad, but had no contingency plan for capturing your memory instead of your beautiful smile. Marissa? Mallory Smith is the best soul I've ever known. Her courage and her grace in the face of such insurmountable odds will be a guiding light to all those who have been pri privileged to meet her. I've never loved a friend like I love Mal, and I will forever cherish the gift of having her as the brightest light in my life since she was born 17 days after me 25 years ago. When reflecting on the longest friendship I have ever had, I'm in awe that in spite of the terrifying daily ordeal of having to confront her mortality, Mallory never let that interfere with her insatiable thirst to live her life to the fullest, to make other people smile, to always put others' needs ahead of hers, and to routinely give more than she ever took. As I think about the most joyful memories I shared with Mal growing up, a ton took place during the summertime. After sharing our preschool years at Temple Isaiah, we went on to different schools, so it was during the summers that we got to spend extended periods of time together, and that was my annual highlight. At Camp S. Kramer Sleepaway Camp during our elementary and middle school years, you could find us Israeli dancing, mooning Maria, or getting totally busted stalking the cute older boys in leadership. How we thought it would be acceptable to keep the camera flash on while taking stalker photos is beyond me. In high school, during our many summer trips to Maui, all of the handsome older guys on the beach would flock to Mal. They would assume she was in her 20s and I was her less graceful 12-year-old sister, mind you, even though I'm older. In typical Mallory fashion, she never left her wing girl behind. It was both of us or none of us. Our summer fun would often carry over to the last Saturday before Thanksgiving, as it would be today. For many years before heading over to Mallory's garden, we had a tradition of having a girly spa day Massages followed by a haircut at Danielle Gravel Salon and getting our makeup done. Pretty cheesy, I know. Full disclosure, we shared a love of many cheesy things, from the movie The Proposal to the band Coldplay, whom we saw in concert together in 2009. I'm going to read aloud a couple lyrics to a Coldplay song called Green Eyes, replace the lyrics with Blue Eyes. Um, Honey, you are a rock upon which I stand, and I came here to talk. I hope you understand that blue eyes, the spotlight shines upon you, and how could anybody deny you? I came here with a load, and it feels so much lighter since I met you, and honey, you should know that I can never go on without you. Blue eyes, honey, you are the sea upon which I float. Uh, I'll skip to, uh, honey, you are a rock upon which I stand. Mal, thank you for being my rock, showing me how to weather storms and strive to be the best person I can be. Like a rock, the joy that I got from being around you will last forever. I love you and miss you so very much. Rest in peace in paradise. Jason, Bellet, Tyler Schultz. Um, I, I did tell Becca that I would finish uh, reading a truncated version um, of her speech. Sorry, I'll just take one second. Uh, Mallory, you wrote in one of your blog posts, with constant adaptation comes a remarkable resilience. When my original goals become unrealistic, I compromise. When those new goals become unrealistic, I compromise again. So Mal, that's what all of us who love you are doing now. Our original goal was for you to live a long, healthy, happy life with the family and career you'd always wanted. When that became unrealistic, we compromised, clinging to the hope of stealing a few more precious years with you. Since that's now unrealistic, we compromise again, keeping you present in our hearts, enriching our lives through the thousands of things that remind us of you every day. 
These things that keep your memory so vivid are different for all of us, though I suspect many overlap. And now we're left cherishing the memories and contributions you gave us, including this piece of wisdom, which I hope brings everyone who loves you the same comfort it brings me. I don't want to be happy every moment of my life. I truly believe we are more capable of experiencing deep joy when we've also experienced the contrast of deep pain. I'm clinging to the hope that the deep pain we're all experiencing from the unfairness of your promising life cut short will make the beauty of your memory that we carry with us even stronger. We love you, Mal. We feel your presence forever. And I did cut out some paragraphs that are beautiful, but you'll have this delivered to you. All right. Jason, and then Tyler Schultz, and then the Tamara Skutsky, Natalie Rabb duo. Hi, everyone. I'm Mallory's friend and neighbor, Jason. And I wanted to share a letter that I wrote to Mallory yesterday on what it feels like to reflect back on our friendship. Hey, Mal. When I close my eyes and think about 16 years of friendship, it's as if I'm staring through a kaleidoscope of memories. All I can do is smile and watch in awe as each memory we made whizzes past my view like a firework show. The memory of us at nine years old watching Shrek in your parents' room quickly blends into the sight of you and your glam squad waving to me from across the street as you filmed your bat mitzvah video. I see us in high school, nibbling on frozen fruit and drinking cappuccinos while we laughed for hours and crammed for AP exams. I see us strutting to Pinkberry with the IV pole my mom dressed up as your boyfriend. And the last text message you wrote me, which read, I love you so, so much. You always made me feel loved and appreciated. And when all those blended memories have settled to the bottom of the kaleidoscope, all I can do is take a step back from that empty view with an unexplainable amount of gratitude for everything that we shared. Mal, I love you so, so, so much, and I will miss you terribly. Tyler, followed by Tamara and Natalie, and then Liana Gurgley, and then Julia Barrero. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tyler, and I know Mallory because I was her RA in college. And I don't want to get her in too much trouble, so I'm not going to say that her room was the party room, but I will say that it was one of the party rooms. Uh, it feels, still feels weird for me to say that I was Mallory's RA because she had a way of disarming people and making you feel like she was your best friend. So her roommates, Maya and Nikiko, would throw these parties with the boys next door, and they would wait until I was on call because they knew that I would just join in with them rather than... <laughs> telling them to be quiet and drink responsibly like a good RA probably should. Uh, also as an RA, I, I hosted an event called Toy on eHarmony. This was before the days of Tinder, um, where I paired everybody in the dorm up on a blind date with somebody else in the dorm. And I paired myself up on a not so blind date with Mallory. <laughs> This blossomed into a beautiful friendship. And last week I had Makiko read her a letter that I wrote. And at the end of it, she scribbled on a piece of paper, I had a crush on him in college, dot, 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 but he's 5'8". <laughs> <laughs> I love you too, Mallory. What the hell goes on at Stanford? Tamara and Natalie, followed by Liana and Julia. Okay, we brainstormed a lot of stories. We were never going to tell them all, but we encourage you to ask us about them later. Um, so we've had um, one of Mallory's doctors mention that she met Mallory upon her decline. And we've also had Tyler mention that Tinder was not yet available when he planned the eHarmony thing. Uh, however, Tinder was available when Mallory's decline began, and she was in the UCLA hospital. So one day we were visiting Mal um, after a, sh a recent hospitalization, and her and Diane told us a story that had happened a, pre a few days earlier. She'd been talking to some guy she had been matched with on Hinge, or Tinder. Hinge, or one, one, of them, one of the two. 
<laughs> she was like, yeah, he's sort of interesting. Like, I don't know, we're just sort of talking. And then all of a sudden she was in the hospital and she was like, he wants, he wanted to have a date with her at the hospital. Well, he wanted to have a date with her and she was like, well, I'm at the hospital. So we don't know the exact details of the story. Becca reminded us a little bit. But <laughs> basically they met in the courtyard, they talked for a while and she was like, yeah, he was like pretty nice, I don't know. I think he wants to hang out again, but he didn't really ask me that many questions about my life. I don't really think I liked him that much. Something that was so fascinating about Mal was what would always cheer her up was washing her hair. Before this date, she told us how she had to convince the nurses to wash her hair, and it was like, <laughs> it, was impossible. Like it was impossible to get done. We'd often do uh, jailbreak walks to Supercuts to make sure she could get her hair washed just to, make sh make, uh, to uplift her day just a little bit. <laughs> um, the final two before we get to the montage, Liana Gurgley and Julia Barrera. They say that the art of being human in this life is learning how to hold two disparate things at the same time. Loss and light, pain and joy, grief and celebration. Mallory, you have been my teacher in the art of being human. You taught me about being brave. You taught me about resilience. You taught me about giggling and appreciate the, appreciating the smallest of things like Cooper rolling around in the grass and a glass of red wine as we sit outside and watch the sunset. You taught me about taking things one day at a time and the value of an unlimited Netflix account. You taught me about how to turn ordinary pool parties at Jason's house into extraordinary moments of laughter and togetherness. You taught me about the courage it takes to open yourself to the messy imperfections of a relationship and also gave me the wise advice each time I was convinced that every frat boy in college was going to be my husband. You taught me that three shots of espresso in my almond milk latte is always better than two and that we are courageous and strong enough to live without certainty. You taught me about the unexpected yet perfect places where friendship happens, a beach in Cabo, a cozy couch in Pittsburgh, the kitchen table on, at your house on El Camino. You taught me that being a friend means saying, I'm right here, I love you, and can you please pass the fries? You taught me about being curious and probing about this planet and why it works the way it does. You taught me that there is no moment we cannot endure and no feeling we can't walk through. Mallory, today I am celebrating your glorious existence and saying thank you for all the things you have taught me. More than anything else, you taught me about being human, about letting our hearts be big enough and spacious enough to hold all the textures of this one fleeting life. Today I am here with so many people who absolutely adore you and I am filled with joy for having laughed with you, spent time with you, and been human with you. I am forever grateful to you for showing me how to live. I love you and I will miss you deeply. Julia Barrero, followed by Jack. This is a story about a picture and a little bit of life that it contains. You see, Mal and I broke a lot of photo conventions. The other day, I noticed something. In half of all of our group photos, I'm standing next to her, a good 10 inches separating the crowns of our heads. How did this odd couple come together time and again? It's simple. It's because of the times I had with Mallory that we didn't get on film. Like the time Mallory and I spent 4th of July figuring out how we could jailbreak her from the C-wing of the Stanford Hospital to go to a friend's party. The doctor and resident appeared, and Mal just had to answer a few questions and push her next check-in by an hour. Everything was going smoothly until Mal casually looked over at some food that Diane and I had picked up earlier and said the P word, as in, oh, that stuff would be great to bring to the party. Mere seconds after the words escaped her lips, I felt my phone buzz. OMG, John heard me and looked up, seven exclamation points. Next came a frantic, did you hear what I said? Oi, oi indeed. But we had a happy ending. 20 minutes later, we made it to the party, basking in a proper 4th of July celebration with good company. That day, Mallory and I took one picture, a classically mismatched shot of us. Just as we appear in the frame, side by side, we lived off camera, embracing laughter, adventure, and the secrets of friendship. 
Mal had a magnetism unlike anyone I've ever met. I adored her and thank my lucky stars for her presence in my life. After all the memories we forged, it's no surprise to me that when there was a photographer at the ready, I found my way next to the tall, blonde, blue-eyed girl in the middle. Conventions be damned, because there was simply no place else I'd rather be. Thank you. We are going to have one more set of remarks officially without a, uh, without a time limit. Um, Jack Goodwin. Uh, after that, we are going to have a montage, um, and then uh, Misha Berach. Um, Jack, you're up. I'd like to talk to you about titles. As you probably know by now, I'm known simply as the boyfriend in the Shader Smith family. An illustrious title, but it was not always this way. It took me a while to earn it. It's safe to say that I'm the newest member of the inner circle of the Mallory Smith fan club. I've worked hard to earn a place in that circle, but along the way, I have held many titles. Diane reminded me of a story earlier this week of when Mallory and I were first courting. Mallory and Diane were on the phone together, and Diane asked who was coming to visit ho Mallory in the hospital later that day. Becca, Michelle, Ari, and somebody, she said. Somebody. Awesome. Humble beginnings, clearly. Soon after that, I ranked up to the next level, attaining titles which contained the word boy in them. <laughs> for whatever reason. The new boy, or for short, the boy. I even heard boy of the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I know she's popular, but that was, you know, maybe a little much. Soon after that, I peaked again, this time attaining the title of Mule. When Mallory travels, in addition to the already massive array of clothing and garments she insists on bringing, a theme shared by some unnamed members of her family, she also had to bring with her enough medicine and portable treatment devices to last her a week. Sorry, I keep dropping this away. Really, it meant that I had to bring all this stuff for her. Uh, maybe some of you can relate to this. Maybe you cannot. I appreciated every moment of the process. Finally, I made it to the title of The Boyfriend. I worked hard for that title. I'd like to keep it that way, if that's all right with you guys. My parents are here tonight. I'm not going to look at them. I think they fell in love with Mal from day one, too. I'm so grateful for their support in the past and the present, and that they're here now. I grew up an only child with an amazing childhood. However, I never had a sibling to call brother or sister. That changed this week because I gained a brother in Micah. That is a title which I also hope you let me keep. Diane and Mark, I know that you did not give birth to me. My, <laughs> my parents are responsible for that one. But I always hope to be part of this family. I'm honored to hold these titles. However, when it came to Mallory, I've known for some time now that the title of boyfriend would never be enough. Fiance, husband, father. These were my penultimate goals with Mallory. We shared many of our dreams with each other, Mal and I. She knew that her body would likely not be able to bear children. Despite that, we both still wanted kids. I told her of the image forever burned into my dreams of Mao and I, one arm around each other, one arm around a child, one each, on our hips. She said that would be lovely. She would have been the greatest mother. I've thought a lot about life this week, about the future Mao and I would have had, about the love we shared, the dreams that will no longer be realized. Many people have told me recently that I'm a good man. Incredible. Extraordinary, even. I'm not deserving of such titles. Or at least, I am certain that I would not be were it not for meeting Mallory. She's the one that brought out the best in me. 
She's the one that brought out the best in everyone. In my eyes, my only extraordinary moment was just my extraordinary luck to find someone as beautiful, as kind, as selfless, as perfect as Mallory Beatrice Smith. Dan once asked me, when you first met Mallory, did you even know what you were getting yourself into? No. God, no. Given what I know now, would I do it all again? The answer is yes. A thousand times yes. Thank you all so much. Um, if everybody on the stage could walk into the audience, um, we are going to have a montage, and then the Mishaberach, and then the Stones household. Yeah. 
ירדתי מהר לכפר שלנו בשערי שושנים אך אהובי לא בבית שקט בין החדרים שם בנהר שליד הכפר שלנו אהובי בלילה לא חזר מצא לו אהובה אחרת וליבי נשבע מחכה ביום ובלילה, לא אין לי כוח שעוד יום יבוא, שושנים עצובות ורובות, אלוהים תעשה שיבוא, מחכה ביום ובלילה, לא Le Bessassan, le Bessassan. 